all the atrocities that have occurred because uh, not too many people know what actually happened uh, to the natives of, of the Americas uh, beginning with the, with the uh, arrival of Columbus. Native people were almost uh, completely uh, annihilated either through uh, wars or through uh, diseases that were brought uh, by the outsiders. And so there's uh, a great deal of uh, documented uh, atrocities that, that we hardly know about. And, and so this year, 1992, um, the Indian people both uh, from Central, South, and, and, and uh, the Upper uh, Hemisphere are bringing those things out. And uh, I think it's just a matter of, of letting people know what happened. And, and uh, today, the Indian people, uh, I think it's a miracle that we have managed to survive. We've paid a dear price for for uh, the right, it's a constant battle. Uh, right from the beginning, the, the moment that Columbus set foot on this land, it's been a constant struggle to uh, maintain our identity, our language, and our way of life. Ojibwe artist, Carl Beam. And I try to, try to carry on the notion of Columbus sailing as a voyage and if you continue that notion, I would say that the voyage is still not over. We are still, in fact, voyaging. To what? I don't know. Manitoulin Island artist James Simon Mishabinijima paints a final warning. Let's say, uh, let's say for an example, like what we're doing to the water. We're the next on the chain link. If we destroy the water, we're destroying ourselves. Like, uh, their body's full of blood, like blood, you would say, it's all, no, it's all no, water, you would say. And you need a sustenance, the water itself, because uh, grass, right down to the, your, uh, what you eat, that's, that's what we need, the water to feed it also. Eh? The hydro itself, we're using it to destroy Mother Earth. Like say, you are not taking this uh, force into another force. But we're not taking care of it, really, you know, like, uh, we, we're using, we're making things bad, that's bad for Mother Earth, using this force of Mother Earth, you would say. And if the fish go, then who goes after the fish? What's the next in the, in the, in the, in the chain? Uh, man. Man. Well, you can see um, also what he calls the plant, the life itself would go. But man is the one who's going to be sick. Like we're so far ahead, we're too fast as, uh, as we're, we were living. Everything is, uh, you're not thinking for what you're doing on Earth, on Earth itself. Cherokee artist Jimmy Durham sounds an alarm. It's the tailpipe of a car, tailpipe and a muffler. And uh, there's another piece there. It's a steering wheel on a, on a base. I call them artifacts of the future. And I imagine some far distant future when some archaeologists dug up those things and that they were made by a people who had heard of a myth of white people. That there was this ancient tribe called white people who drove things called automobiles. And this later tribe takes the, the ruins of these automobiles and makes fetishistic objects and then much later, other archaeologists dig up those artifacts and try to imagine, were there really ever any white people? What was the white civilization like? And the byproducts of the Columbus Enterprise? Astronauts tell us clear-cutting scars can be seen from the moon. Today, rainforest in the Western Hemisphere, originally at 3.4 billion acres, is down to 1.6 billion, going, going, going at the rate of 166 square miles a day. 
At least 140 major animal and bird species have become extinct since 1492. Wilderness areas have decreased by 96%. So now, uh, looking back 500 years after Columbus, uh, are you optimistic that uh, the life for the uh, Aboriginal person is going to improve here? Well, probably my best answer is that <clears throat> I think it's coming this way because I have met with world-renowned scientists who are asking about the Indian way, who are saying, the present Newtonian approach to science, the Newtonian approach to Western culture is coming to an end. It's leaving many an unanswered, you know, many questions unanswered. We're looking for a new way to look at science. So I see scientists are groping around for a new way to explain nature. And they're finding out that the Indians have the answer. The latest example of that is, but two, three years ago, a UN report on the environment came out. Well, the advice that came out of that UN report was, if you want to know anything about the environment, ask the India. So the new way is the old way. The new way is the old way. They just have to discover it. The North American Indian has been redefining himself according to his tradition. Till a white man came, everything has changed. Kind of lost our pride because they dragged into us some what they call it was their making money things that. Uh, they make money, such things as a dope and the liquor and all that kind of stuff. That's when the Indians started to get uh, lost, kind of lost their pride at one time. At, at the early age, some of those kids and people. But I hope, I have a great hope that they're getting it back again. <laughs> He has now developed an increased interest in his tradition and theater. He was robbed of his history. The grace and magic of children taught memory. When I was uh, very young, we had no television then, so we had radio. And uh, my Sunday afternoons were involved in listening to these uh, radio programs of Hopalong Cassidy and the Lone Ranger. I was really fascinated by that. And I had a horse when I was young, and I asked my mother to buy me all this cowboy outfit. So I, I related to these cowboys immediately, because all I understood and all I heard of in these movies was the strange, uh, these Indians, you know, that they were always and, and mind you, this is radio, so you had to imagine that uh, it, to me an Indian did not make sense. It's just cowboys and Indians. But because a cowboy that I had seen in comic books and I, you know, was, was someone who rode horses, that's who I could relate to. And we be, went to a city school, an integrated school as they call it. In those play yards, uh, that's when I understood and, and, and people made me understand that I was an Indian. Regardless of what race or color you come from or racial background you come from, you end up rooting for the, for the good guys, of course, right? So that's, we were sublimely seduced in that manner. Yeah. And of course that resulted in, in a lot of, of ident <laughs> identity problems, which with this generation of native artists, our generation are working very hard to turn around. Because I think that when you go around com committing crimes of, of, of theft, of that, of that, of any kind, you besmirch your soul, you, you destroy your spirit. And I think that uh, British colonization has had that, that effect on British culture, on, on England, the English-speaking culture is a, is a culture without spirit, in my estimation. You know, it's a very wealthy, uh, materially very wealthy 
technologically very sophisticated, but it ain't got no soul. With us, it's the reverse. We don't have the technology. We don't have the, the money in the bank. But man, we got soul. <laughs> and I'm proud of that. It's just, it's a gift to be a Native person. It's a real gift. Being an Indian to me is very important. When I look at the feelings of people, when I watch people speak, some of them talk from the books, some of them talk from uh, what is written before them. But being an Indian, I can talk about what I see, the animals that I hear, the flowers. When I look up into the heavens and see the thunderbirds and see the eagles and all the little animals that fly around, and when I look down on, on Mother Earth, I can see the medicines that she has given us. And I look into the bushes, I see the berries. And all those give me respect. And I could think what God has given me as an Indian person. We can make people unafraid to be in the forest. You know, because white people, they don't like being in the forest too much. They find it pretty strange, pretty freaky. Ron Hamilton is our witness and one of our guides in the woods. If you look at uh, all of time on this planet, and then you look at European contact here, it's just a sliver on, on, the, on the timeline. Just a sliver. So then what about all this other stuff? Is it worth knowing? And I'd, I'd suggest that, like I said earlier, that we seem to be at a time when people who are immigrant here, people who are immigrants and living here, and they really, in fact, do want to know. They do want to feel like they have some reason to be here. And I think that most Indian people really are very glad that all these European people are here. I certainly am. I don't feel bad that you're here. Uh, and so if you're going to be here and, and if we're going to be glad that you're here and you're going to be wanting to be here, your sense of being here can't be complete until you have some sense of my sense of being here because I've been here a lot longer than you. There's my final note. I think... I don't want to instruct white people. I don't want to instruct my colonizer. When the situation is different, when the Cherokees are free, when Indian people are free, we can say amazing things to each other. But until we're free, until we're out of colonization, and of course I know freedom is a relative thing and, and we might be pretty bad to each other, if we were decolonized in the classical sense. But until we're not in a colonial situation, until we're not in a subservient person and the boss person relationship, I would rather we had nothing to say. I would rather that we not confess and not instruct. When you think that indigenous populations lived all over the world um, pretty happily and in harmony with their environment for thousands and thousands of years before the invaders came. And you compare that with what's happened in the last 500 years. Uh, it's bad news. We didn't create that bad news. The Ainu of Japan didn't create that bad news. The Maori of New Zealand didn't create that bad news. The white people did. And it's time for them to look at what they've done and how to change, how to improve the damage that they have done to the world and to the people of the world. There's a word called Messiah. It seems like it fits in with the Hopi. The Great Spirit is Masa, who gave us this knowledge, prophets, and warnings, and he breathed into it the sacred stone tablets he made for the Hopi, two sets of them, give it to them. And the white brother, who also is a Hopi, but his skin was much lighter, and two, two brothers received two sets of stone tablets. We still have two sets of in Horaibi, in Hotbella, and the other was given to a white brother who took some of our people and went east direction around the other side of the world. And he was given special mission to record things, to invent things, and to make life beautiful, clean, and lasting on that side. Then he was to come back here, look for his younger brother who was still holding on to this land through prayer, meditation, ceremony, and fasting, 
and keep this land in the Western Hemisphere beautiful. And we certainly can't live with technological society for another 60 years because we won't last that long. I don't think anyone can own the land and I don't think anyone does. They have title to that land, and that's all. But I think they've forgotten that the land owns us. We are the land. Author Wilfred Peltier. It takes a long time not to feel like an alien, a long time to feel at home, a long time to search out and discover who you are. But if you go all the way with that exploration, it takes you beyond race, beyond color, beyond class, beyond every kind of category, and you find that you belong to humanity, and that's who you are. When you no longer feel like an alien anywhere, you've come home, you know who you are. You found your family, the human family, and there is no such thing as the human family and others, not anymore. As long as you leave anyone out, you are the alien, and that search for wholeness, for oneness, for who you are has to continue. And the land is sacred. You don't live off it like a parasite. You live in it and it in you, or you don't survive. And that is the only worship of God there is. When you buy land, you are dispossessed by the act of purchase. The whole transaction is a lie that says, this is my land, it belongs to me. And the truth is that you belong to it. Sea has lost much of its richness, and great areas of the land itself lie in waste. Perhaps it's time for the raven to start looking for another clamshell. Perhaps truly it is we who became the dispossessed in the war against the Indians. We cannot, we cannot um, let the, yesterday's tears blind the eyes to what we should do tomorrow. So with that we have to, to determine what, what path we're going to follow, what road we're going to walk. It's, 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 a, it's a new day, it's a new age, and um, we have to know how we're going to paddle our canoe in the 21st century. This is the sacred place where the Navajo come to pray. Now, perhaps if we are to understand the story we've told tonight, the war against the Indians, it is our common history. We must listen to the prayer of another great native person, Chief Dan George. <laughs> That's nature which you know what to quiet and not just behave. That's same motion, say it's a no motion. Ciao, that's true. No chase, yeah. Oh, great spirit, whose voice I hear in the winds and whose breath gives life to the world, hear me. I come to you as one of your many children. I am small and weak. I need your strength and your wisdom. May I walk in beauty. Make my eyes ever behold the red and purple sunset. Make my hands respect the things that you have made and my ears sharp to hear your voice. Make me wise so that I may know the things you have taught your children, the lessons you have hidden in every leaf and rock. Make me strong so that not to be superior to my brothers but to be able to fight my greatest enemy, myself. 
make me ever ready to come to you with straight eyes so that when life fades as the fading sunset my spirit without shame. Jay! 